Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Venture One Nine webinar. I'm Jonathan, and we are going to jump right in today because we have a lot to cover. And so here's how this is going to work. First, I just want to give all of you permission to sit back and take in the discussion today. You're certainly welcome to, to take notes, but don't feel like you've got to get everything down just right. As a gift to you, we're going to capture today's content in writing, and we're going to send those notes to you along with the PowerPoint after our time together. Also, you can ask specific panelists specific questions today, and they will answer those toward the end of our time together. So submit all of your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, but in the Q&A box, and please address your question to the specific panelist that you'd like to hear from. And again, we will deal with those uh, toward, the, uh, toward the top of the hour. Before I pray for us, I want to welcome our special guests today. We have Tammy Abernathy from Hope Women's Center, Bobby Cox from Go10, Nate Hughes from One Mission, Julie Suplee from House of Refuge Sunny Slope, Nicole Thompson from Harvest Compassion Center, and Kimberly Trichelle from Hope Kids, Arizona. Welcome everybody. I'm excited about our conversation today. And uh, let me take just a minute right now and uh, lead us in a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much for these few minutes that we can spend today, uh, just uh, building each other up and encouraging each other and learning from one another. And God, we just commit this time to you and pray that you would make it special. God, we also just lift up uh, uh, our country and, and everything that's happening these days. God, we just, we lay that before you. Uh, Jesus, you call us to be salt and light. And uh, would you um, uh, use us in that way? Would you direct us? Would you guide us? Would, uh, would you show us uh, what we need to be about these days to, uh, uh, to bring about change and to, uh, to love people around us? God, thank you again for this time together. We commit it to you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I reached out to all of you, my panelist friends here, a while back because uh, you've seen great growth by God's grace over the past few years connected with your nonprofit work. Over $2.7 million in combined growth for, for all of you over the past few years. And I asked you one simple question. My question was this, without overthinking it, what attributed to your growth? And you began sharing with me, and, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And so we're actually going to work through 10 of your responses together today. And here are the first three. And Tammy, I'd like to, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, Forbes says actually that one of the main reasons that nonprofits don't exist or they're not able to exist past year five is because of a lack of strategic direction. And one of the specific things you mentioned here was, was uh, how important it was to gain clear strategic direction for Hope Women's Center. And you talked about that as being a catalyst for your growth. Talk to us a little bit about that concept. How did you get this strategic direction and, and, and what has it meant for your overall work? Yes, so we took our vision and really through your coaching, Jonathan, you were key in this process for us. But through your coaching, we took our vision and we developed that into a really clear plan where we had a set goal that we were going toward and measurable steps to get there. It really gave us a roadmap that we were able to then take and take to our donors that showed really thoughtful and prayerful intention. We knew the big picture God had given us, but this now showed us some specific ways to get there. And so it helped in presenting that to donors. And then it also helped unify our team around it because now everybody could see that big picture and how we felt God was leading us to get to that end result. And it wasn't something that also we started this six years ago in terms of developing that strategic plan. And it's gone through many changes since then. I'm even working on changes right now post pandemic or still looking at what it's going to look like after the pandemic. Pandemic. So it's not a plan that we're stuck with. It's a plan that continues to grow and evolve, 
but it really was helpful for our team, for our donors, for our board, um, just for the ministry as a whole to know that we had a clear plan of where we felt God was taking us. Hmm. Yeah, excellent. Uh, flesh out a little bit what it means to have a clear plan as far as how that plays into being able to share with donors and potential donors and get them excited about the future. How, how, how did that play out for you or how is that playing out for you? So, so part of our plan was that we knew we wanted to expand and to grow into other centers. And so being able to share that vision with donors, but also share, these are the goals that we need to accomplish to begin that process. These are some of the measurable things we put in place that we need to be steps we need to take to get there, then I could get a donor excited about, yes, this is the vision, but we're going to make sure our existing centers are sustainable before we take on a new one. There was just a lot of thought put into, mm -hmm. these are the goals for our existing center. And then these are what it looks like as we feel God is leading us into new areas. This are, these are the things that we want to see in place to get there. So mm -hmm. that was helpful to show donors. We had thought through that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, I always say uh, when you gain clear strategic direction as an organization, uh, you then have to ask yourselves as a group, okay, now what is it going to cost to go this direction and to implement all of this? Mm -hmm. And it is so helpful to bring that to donors and potential donors and they get excited about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great yeah. stuff. Anybody else want to weigh in on, on uh, the strategic direction piece here? I have a question. Oh, is go that okay if I go, Nate? <laughs> okay. So, Tammy, when you guys were doing your strategic plan in this direction, um, was it just you and your staff sat down first, or was your board involved first? Like, what were the no, steps yeah. of the planning it's, process? So, it actually started um, between my board and I. And so, that it was something that we really began to look at prayerfully. We definitely had Jonathan's help in coaching us through that and how to really make this um, into something translatable that we could, get, could really make it clear. So we worked on it as a board and myself. And then as we got a good draft, then I took it to the staff, got a lot of input, mm -hmm. tweaked things. And, to, and then it became a very collaborative between staff, myself and the board. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How often, Tammy, are you um, one tweaking the strategic direction and then two how often are you sharing the big picture with your staff um, to kind of remind yeah. them of where mm -hmm. you're going so we i set the strategic vision initially or strategic plan for three years we quickly found that was too far like i needed to really be looking at it annually and tweaking things on it annually and so that is something that then we look at as a staff at least annually but even now like i said as we're thinking about shifts that we've made even with the pandemic and thinking ahead to some programs that were shifting and changing, then that's something that we'll, I'll discuss with the staff even sooner that we've already talked about as a board and that we'll begin to, to kind of change, make those changes with. Yeah, that's great. The more people you involve in the process, the more buy-in there's going to be. And then, um, Tammy, I completely agree with you. I think in today's day and age, three years out is pretty far. And so uh, what's the right timeline and how does that need to play out? Uh, but one thing is, is for certain, and that's when you have the clear strategic direction as an organization, then you show up every day to work and you know what to do and you know what not to do. And it, and it keeps you uh, dialed in and, and, uh, and focused in a great way. Uh, and, I just want to add really quick yeah, before you sure. go to the next thing, because I forgot yeah. this, and this I thought was key. I actually also brought in a couple of my top donors that I wanted them to mm -hmm. see the plan that we were making. I wanted their input. And so that actually, they had some really helpful um, thoughts and questions and additions that really helped us in that process. So that was also a key component. Yeah, certainly helps with buying. Yeah, Nicole. Jonathan, can I add to everything, Tammy, um, I agree with, and we've done the same we had five practical P's that we went through when we did ours for the first time about four years ago. And it was really redefining, redefining our purpose, mm -hmm. which people would be involved, our process, and that helped us gather the plan. And then of course we pray over every step of that. So we kind of had those as our guidelines. And then as I talk to new donors or give tours, or try to in five minutes say, what is your plan for the next five, 10 years? 
I really just go back to those peas again and I can spit it out in two minutes. And I will tell you just as recently as last week, I had a brand new donor walk in who I did not know would be a brand new donor until after a 40 minute meeting. And he actually gave a large gift about two hours <laughs> later. And I really didn't even have time to sit down because I was busy because we're in the middle of, of a pandemic. And yet he really um, told me in an email that you just had everything laid out that I could understand it so well. So even just making sure everyone can understand it easily and clearly yeah. um, will really get your message across. Yeah, I uh, love that. And a perfect example uh, for those of you tuned in, if you didn't uh, or weren't able to write down all those five Ps, that's okay. We're going to send those to you. So you're going <laughs> to you're gonna have those. And that's a perfect lead in because when you have a clear strategic direction, it affects every part of your organization, including fundraising and fundraising plans that you're setting out to execute, right? And so uh, a number of you said one of the big differences for us over the past few years, a key to our growth, is that we executed specific fundraising plans, which in my mind is the opposite, right, of the, uh, uh, of the pray and spray method of fundraising, <laughs> which is, right, just try a bunch of things and pray that something works. This is, this is intentionality. This is uh, specificity. And so, um, Julie, talk to us a little bit about this. You were one of the ones that mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, House of Refuge, Sunny Slope, uh, really implementing specific fundraising plans. How did that play out? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And I think when we started this three or four years ago of being, um, of really working on a fundraising plan, it wasn't elaborate. There weren't a lot of moving parts. You know, I tend to want to do um, less things, but do them very well. Mm -hmm. And so we had a few strategies that we wanted to do well, and it would, of course, include fundraisers, but part of it was also how did we want to treat our donors? How did we want to thank them? How did we want to communicate with them? And that was part of our plan as well as what was our culture around that. And uh, we also, I shared with a, a board and the staff to get input and, and buy-in. And I found every year that we did that, the support began to grow too. So don't be discouraged if at first you feel like you're carrying all that, it's a repetition of the message that will be helpful. And then uh, the other thing I wanna share is uh, about 18 months ago, we tried doing a different type of direct mailer than we had ever done before. And the first one that went out bombed. <laughs> it did not work at all. And I was ready to pull the plug on it. But we have a great direct mail partner. And with me being really honest and sharing why I was disappointed and my insight on why it didn't work, but also listening to their insight about why it didn't work, we, we've stuck with it. And already this year and this calendar year, using that, that same method and doing that We've probably raised about fifty or sixty thousand dollars, which is will be about ten percent, fifteen percent of our annual revenue. So if it doesn't work at first, uh, sometimes that's okay, and you got to stick with it. Would be my uh, learning through that process. Yeah, I love that. Don't be afraid to try new things, test things out. Uh, learn from what happens there and, and, and keep, uh, keep headed, uh, headed in that direction. That's great. I love that. Mm -hmm. Nicole, Bobby, Tammy, what are your thoughts here? Well, my first thought is make really good friends with others who do fundraising <laughs> and learn from them. I'm always about working smarter and not harder. We have a full-time staff of three people. Um, so we are not heavy on staff. So um, actually, Julie, um, I'll give her kudos. Um, they did a bowling event and we normally do a 5K and our numbers have been declining and the numbers and the fundraising numbers have gone down as well. And so don't be stuck on something just because we always do it. So I went to my advisory team and said, hey, it's been going down a little bit. Maybe we should mix this up. And everyone wanted to go bowling. And I was like, I don't know how to do a bowling fundraiser. Yet then I did some research and my friend Julie at Refuge House, they've been bowling for years. Yeah. So, you know, the first call I made was to Julie and said, can you come over and just talk to me about this one fundraising event? And um, through that, 
we developed our own, used her model and tweaked it a little bit. And now we've been bowling for a couple of years and it's been very successful and a lot of fun. So I don't think you have to go out there and I add you something so unique, so different. You got to find something that's going to fit your demographic, your team, your volunteers, your champions, and then really dive into it. Yeah, I also always say go big. And I love that Julie tried something new and it didn't quite work, but she stuck with it. So when we did our first bowling event, I'm like, we're doing the whole bowling alley. Like, we're doing 200 plus. And I just assumed Julie did that. And she's like, you did you did the whole bowling alley? Here? <laughs> and I'm like, well, didn't you? And I kind of was very naive and not knowing. Um, and then I got to kind of challenge Julie back and saying, oh, next year you do the full you know, bowling alley. And we did it the year one. We actually had too many people show up. It was a great event. So I always, I always aim really high. Just so you know, I get laughed at a lot because my <laughs> fundraising goal numbers are over 100k every time and they're like you're crazy and i said okay thank you so but that's okay you know we're gonna <laughs> aim high we've got god on our side if you don't aim high you'll never know what is your limit mm -hmm. right yeah. so so go go big the first time and we're doing the full bowling alley too now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you nicole excellent excellent I yeah i Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go. I just I love okay. to echo that collaboration yeah. because I I think that I love this about groups like this and that we're all in it together for the kingdom. And I just got off the phone two weeks ago with somebody from that Nate had connected me with at One Mission that really helped me with some of the some ideas for an event that we were doing that they had done um, and just was was fantastic. It was awesome to be able to share that with another ministry that was doing it well and to be able to get ideas and just to collaborate on some things. So I think that that was awesome. So I echo, I echo Nicole's voice in that. Yeah, absolutely. When I think about specific fundraising plans in my mind, I think about, okay, looking at the whole year, right. As, as a whole and saying, uh, uh, what do we want to try this year? What do we want to ramp up? What do we want to make better? Um, what, what's the overall plan? Uh, uh, this happens to me, uh, guys all the time. I'll say to a new organization, uh, tell me a little bit about your programming. And they can immediately talk forever about that. And then I say, talk to me about your specific fundraising plans on how you're going to raise the money that you need to raise so that you can handle and do all that programming. And a lot of times that's where the conversation doesn't flow as, as, uh, as, as easily um, because they're thinking more along the lines of, well, we might try this or we might try this. And, and I sometimes don't sense, um, again, the, uh, uh, the, the, the specific thought process and the specific planning process of looking at an entire year and really mapping things out, planning things out, and then connecting strategy uh, to those plans. So uh, I would really uh, stress intentionality as well, which, which really moves into uh, the next concept. And Nate, you specifically brought this up. This certainly is connected right with intentional fundraising. You said one of the keys for one mission and the growth that you've seen over the past few years is that you diversified your, your income streams, you diversified your revenue streams. And uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about, a little bit about that. I'm wondering, when did you first realize you needed to diversify revenue streams? And then uh, uh, you didn't just wake up one day and, and look around at your team and go, hey, we, we diversified revenue streams. No, it took something specific and intentional. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so I think, we're still needing to diversify. I think COVID has, has made us realize that. So, um, you know, we do a lot of trips down to the field um, and mission trips are a huge source of revenue for the organization. Um, and we've always known there, there's a threat in that. And mm -hmm. so um, that was kind of, the, that's been the impetus going back five years or six years um, always wanting to continue diversifying revenue so that we're not dependent on trips because our mission in, in a lot of ways isn't dependent on, on trips, you know, being a community development organization where families are earning their hours to receive a house. We don't, these houses can be built mm -hmm. in the field with locals only. So we've, we've all, that's been kind of the impetus. Like how can we continue to diversify how, how much revenue is coming in and where it's coming in from so that we're not always tied to, to trip revenue. Um, and so, 
that still becomes the case now that the borders are closed, we can't even do trips. And so, um, so that's really the impetus. And then just, I mean, some of it's as simple as what are tried and true methods of like monthly giving. So five years ago, six years ago, we only had 30 monthly donors. Now we mm. have 340. Uh, wow. uh, some of it is donors or partners who have come up with great ideas. So we have a program where we partner with people in the housing industry, realtors particularly, and they're giving a portion of their, um, their income. And every time a, they sell, help a, sell a house or buy a house for a client, they're donating a portion of that. That makes sense, right? They're helping people get yeah. in homes. We're helping people get in homes. But that was all the idea of one of our partners. He was a realtor. He came to us and said, I have this idea. And then over the next few years, we, we developed it out and are still, still developing it. So, so some of it's that. Um, we, with our bike, our bike ride, we have a bike ride from Phoenix to Mexico every year, uh, fundraiser that were capped at 120 riders. That's the max amount of people we can get from Phoenix to Mexico over two days on the road safely. And so that forced us to, to think through doing a virtual ride that kind of mm -hmm. uh, goes alongside of the ride. And now even more so with not knowing what the situation is uh, gonna be like in February, we're trying to proactively think about what if we can't do the ride this year? Now we might have to put all of our eggs into a virtual ride bucket. But by doing that, we could end up opening up this revenue stream much broader than we ever imagined. And so, so some of it's been proactive, some of it's been uh, a donor coming to us, and some of it's been by necessity. Yeah, hey, excellent. Yep. I had a question. Have yep. you guys targeted... Um, anything from a numerical standpoint, like we don't want any single revenue stream to exceed a certain percent of our total revenue? Um, not, not that directly, but we look at what our highest revenue streams are. And that could, I mean, that could be a single donor, right? I think we probably all have a few mm -hmm. donors who, who make up a significant portion. And so we haven't set like a number, like we don't want any revenue stream to provide more than 30%, but but I do think we're looking and saying, how can we get all of our revenue streams to about the same so that one mm -hmm. doesn't sink us more than another? You know, if you have 10 revenue streams, they're all doing 10%. I don't know what the, the industry standard is, but that feels really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. And I think, Nate, right, the reason you want to diversify is right from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, sustainable organizations have various healthy streams of income. And I, I, I think what you explained up front really paints the picture. Uh, if 80% of your budget is coming in through, through trips <laughs> and then COVID hits, <laughs> right? And, and all trips are off, right? That's going to, that's going to create a big problem. So um, uh, uh, yeah, I really encourage organizations to, to look at their income streams. How diverse are they? Um, and, uh, and maybe some, uh, uh, identify some areas for growth there, uh, throughout the rest of, uh, throughout the rest of this year. And again, you've got to connect specific strategy with it, right? Nate, the stuff you talked about didn't just happen. Uh, you made some decisions, you connected some strategy and you began to, uh, to walk in that direction. So that's, we've uh, even, we've even closed off revenue streams that mm -hmm. seem to be drying up. And rather than continue pumping energy mm. effort into it, so it's also important not to just go full throttle into a revenue stream yeah. and put all your eggs in a new revenue stream basket, right? That just flips the pendulum the other way. So it's good to test revenue streams, give some energy into them, and then if they gain traction, continue running with them. Yeah, I, I love that. that that's a, that's a, a great point, a great reminder. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it, it, Kimberly, let's move over uh, to you. We could spend probably all day on, on just a few of these topics, right? These are, these, this stuff's so fascinating here. But Kimberly, I want to move on to you. And, and when I sent this survey out 
to all of you. I did not push you in any specific directions. I did not say, hey, you should say this or you should say this, because uh, I would really agree with that. It was a blank sheet of paper, right? And you came back and you said something very specific and very simple that has uh, really helped Hope Kids Arizona get to the next level. You said we finally found the right CRM, the right customer relationship management system or the right database. Talk to us a little bit about what life was like before that <laughs> and, and what life is like now and the difference that that's made. Yep, thanks Jonathan. Um, for us at Hope Kids, we are a small um, organization and we only have three full-time staff at the Arizona chapter as well. Um, we are a national organization though, so we have other chapters throughout the United States. But we found that um, we were just using basically Google. So drive sheets, Excel sheets, things like that, um, just to maintain databases for people. And when it was time to send Christmas cards, you pull from your list. Um, when you were using MailChimp to mail out things periodically um, to give information, our, our used to be newsletters that we all wrote by ourselves. Um, it was something that you were just pulling from your spreadsheets. And if somebody said they wanted to unsubscribe, then you'd go in your Excel sheet or your Google Drive sheet and remove. Or if you meet somebody at a mixer or at you know, one of Jonathan's workshops, you'd, okay, I'm going to add them to my spreadsheet, um, which is great. And I'm not discrediting it for other organizations that are still using that. However... Sure. Once we got a CRM, it gave a, it opened up all these new possibilities. So um, I think all of us will agree that our donor information is gold, right? This is what th this is what keeps us going is having this information. And you want to protect your people and you want to protect your information. And so as we've gone through these over the years, going through all of this, um, all of these different changes with our websites and the internet and where people can, fund and how they can donate and social media, I think it's important to gather all that information and make sure that it's all being captured, right? So you know what kind of donor you have, and it's not really just a name and a spreadsheet anymore. It's when do they donate? How often do they donate? Which emails do they click in? And which emails do they click links? You know, what, what are their likes? What are their dislikes? And that's something that, um, you know, the internet and Google knows all about all of us anyways, right? So why not take that information and create more information on your donors. You know, we were sitting in workshops with you, Jonathan, and we are learning about raising champions and intentional thank yous. Um, and it really gave us the opportunity to see that as a broad scope and a picture of here are these people now, how do we communicate with them in the way that they want to be communicated with? So that way the golf, the people that like golf and only donate at that, they're the only ones getting this email, maybe three or four times where everybody only gets just one general email. Or if you know somebody always gives it Arizona Gives Day, instead of just like knowing that or just having it in your head, like you're making notes on things, you know, you know what inspires them, you get them more engaged and you're documenting everything through your CRM. You have, you know, you have the ability to pull reports of when people are yeah. donating, who's donating what, you know, it's just really been instrumental in us for our growth who we're thanking and really raising up our champions by just being able to have a big picture and seeing those trends um, and to help us raise those champions. Yeah. How about the rest of you? Where are you on database these days? How's that, how's that working for you and, and what does it do for you? I would add to Kimberly, I completely agree. And with, in addition to that, it's allowed us to be more personable building those relationships. I think everything we do with our organizations, whether we're helping someone, whether we're bringing a volunteer in or a donor, it's all about relationships. And for us, our CRM has really allowed me to be more personable. And as if I'm writing a thank you note or sending a receipt, I can go into their account in our CRM and I can see all these notes and like, oh, I don't know this person personally, but they have volunteered for the past six months. So then I can actually write a handwritten note and speak very honestly and thank them for what they're doing. So it's about training your staff and your key volunteers to use it correctly, A, and then you can really see some fruit from that as that person that receives that, that note, like, oh, they really know who I am. I'm not just a number to them. And we have over 1,500 volunteers annually so it's kind of hard to keep track of them at times but we want every single one to feel really special so the CRM has definitely helped us do that 
I think one thing that you said is key um, is that making sure people are using it properly, right? Because you can spend all the money on a CRM or have this information that's getting dumped in. And one, it could be, be get the information be getting dumped in differently by different people um, and two, not being utilized properly because there's really cool stuff that can happen, right? Um, and the way that you're sending out your emails, the way that you're communicating with everybody. So that um, is great. So we definitely identified um, a staff member from our national team who's just part-time and that's what they do. It's called donor stewardship. And she kind of helps look after that. And our marketing team helped kind of create the plans around that. Um, but that way there, we have like a manual and it's, this is how you enter people in by name. And yes, you document their volunteer hours. We document when we have phone calls, we document, when we have meetings and thank you. And you're right, Nicole, because it gives us the opportunity to say, thank you for volunteering at X event on this day, or thank you for, um, your continued donations to Hope Kids every February or whatever it is, because you're right, intentional thank yous are something that we've learned about with Jonathan. And anybody who knows Hope Kids knows that we do love our thank yous and we are hammering them out like probably hundreds a week, <laughs> I guarantee you. Um, so it's definitely something that we need to keep an eye on. So that is a great point. It's and, and right, it's all about it's all about engagement. It's all about connecting with people in a personal way and understanding what they're passionate about and ways that God is leading them, maybe a specific way to volunteer or a specific way to give. And, and Kimberly, I love what you said there, being able to communicate to individual people about things that matter to them and, and, and having the right database helps you understand all that. And, uh, uh, and it prevents you from having, like you said earlier, to just send the same message to everybody uh, all at once. Kimberly, we actually had a question uh, that just came in that simply says, which CRM did you settle on and why? Uh, any direction there? Um, yes, we settled with eTapestry. Our marketing team did a lot of work on that and researching and for our size and what we wanted to do, eTapestry was best. Like I said, we're national. So there's only three people in Arizona, but we have six chapters and we have a national team of people that um, we all work from home. Um, and for us, that was good. So we have about 15,000 entries currently in our e-tapestry and we do clean out yearly and we do clean outs monthly too for our mm -hmm. emails, mm -hmm. our monthly mm -hmm. newsletters mm -hmm. that go out. So we are always on top of it. It's something that has to be done. Um, and we make notes of that. So it doesn't mean I lost you normally. Like if somebody unsubscribes, think about that. You've probably just, okay, well, I guess I'm going to take them off my spreadsheet or make a note of that or, you know, but if you're doing it properly, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to send them a Christmas card. Then, you know, at least once a year, um, we don't do a lot of mailings. We only do it once yeah. a year. Um, but I know that that person doesn't want my emails, but maybe at least once a year, they'll like to hear from us and see what we're doing with a physical mail and letter. So that's a good example of how you can just kind of still um, be able to have that information, capture it and find other ways to speak to your donors and volunteers. Well, and do the research out there. Different systems uh, work in different ways for different organizations and some are gonna be a great fit for you and some may not be a great fit. So um, I will say to everybody out there, uh, feel free to send me an email following our time together. I've got uh, a couple uh, uh, documents that talk about different options out there and uh, uh, it analyzes them a little bit and um, uh, and I'm happy to uh, happy to send those happy to send those your way and so good Bobby let's uh, uh, let's move over to you here and uh, uh, talk about uh, adding new staff um, uh, you said this was one of the things that helped you guys at go 10 get to the next level and so talk to us a little bit about that I think hiring can be tricky, right? Hiring can, uh, can make or break an organization for, for quite some time. And so talk to us a little bit about uh, how you decided, uh, when was the right time to hire, how you decided on the right people. Walk us through that process a little bit. Yeah, part of it to understand a little bit about our model is a little bit different than most nonprofits that receive grants and large donations or multiple uh, members or donors who are participating, our model of ministry involves um, lots of different people who are raising their own financial support. So getting new people in, uh, every time we bring somebody in, we're bringing in a fundraiser. And so it's not like we're just bringing in one person to do the fundraising, everybody's raising their own support. So typically when we bring in a new staff, they're going to bring in 
about 50, at least $50,000 um, in, in support. And so um, one of the things with the key staff, so that's one thing of understanding our model and when do you bring those on as often as you can. Because <laughs> every time you bring somebody else on, they're bringing in a, a revenue stream. Mm. And in addition to that, of that, let's say that whatever they bring in, roughly 10% of that goes to a general budget. So there's, there's a, you're feeding this ongoing program cost by taking a, a small assessment on everybody who comes in. Now, the one thing that I would say to that is, uh, in the beginning, when we first started, we didn't really give, we did all of our fundraising training was in-house. So it was just like, hey, we'll teach you how to do that and go do it. So we actually made a strategic uh, initiative to make sure that all of our staff got proper funding. Uh, and training. So we would send them out to a boot camp and they would, we would pay, outsource that, pay for that, get that done. And that's, that's been incredible to help somebody get 100% funded. So I'd highly recommend that. And I'd say one other thing about key staff is that, uh, and this all connects to this strategic plan, right? You know, because we have this strategic yeah. initiative here, but I would say a key staff that, that we were, were able to bring on was somebody who was um, specifically focused on mobilization. So it's all a part of a, a chain here. So if you have someone focused on out uh, of getting those people on board with you and then getting them trained and then getting them out there fundraising, it was actually better for us to bring somebody on that would work full-time mobilization, bringing people on staff, kind of like a recruiter or headhunter sort of thing, instead of a development person who's out there looking for grants and, and funding like that. And one, so one thing uh, that I would just want to highlight too, because this kind of tied into that whole strategic plan that we talked about in the very beginning. I didn't, I didn't say anything there, but we've had strategic plans, you know, over periods of time that end up being documents that either sit in a drive or, a, you know, you might reference them annually yeah. or something. Yep. Nope. I was really frustrated with that. And so I, I, I created a, like a, a play sheet, like Cliff Kingsbury's play sheet, you know, that he's got <laughs> ready to go. So it's, it's always ready. And so in, in part of that, whether it's financial mobilization uh, or, or program, it's all right here and it's easy. And so it, it all ties into bringing in key, key staff to help make that happen. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Bobby, uh, so unique model for you guys. Uh, your staff raises personal support. If people have some specific questions connected with personal support raising and learning a little bit more about that model, I assume you'll, you'll make some time for them and, and talk them through this a little bit and help them uh, learn from, from your experience. Um, and so if, if some of you are out there and you want to explore this a little bit more, um, uh, we'll provide Bobby's email address for you and you can reach out to him and, and learn a little bit more uh, about this as well. So, so Bobby, one, one follow-up question, I guess, for me then is, um, do you identify a, a, a specific aspect of Go10 uh, that, that needs to get done? We want to we raise this to the next level and we feel like we need a staff member here. So we then go and find that staff member or do you just look for great people who you feel like are really gonna uh, uh, buy into the mission of Go10, help it get to the next level, and then sort of figure out from there uh, what they should focus on. Which, which approach do you take? Uh, we take both approaches. So I would say that finding great people who, who buy into the mission, and then we can find the, the best seat on the bus for them once, once they get here. But at the same time, we're, we're also in a place of, of growth on the financial side where we really need to bring somebody on who's salaried, not somebody who raises support, but somebody mm -hmm. who's salaried, mm -hmm. who can help us with uh, all of the donor relations. And this ties into the, the CRM, because when you have that many people raising money and you've got a lot of donors out there, some people giving $15 a month and some people giving $500 a month, you've just got a lot of people. Our CRM, it's really important that we receipt them and on a regular basis. Yeah, sure. And, and there are still some people who actually write checks, you know, and so if they write a check to you and you don't send them a receipt monthly, you know, that says, hey, this was your statement and here's your envelope to be able to send your next month, you might lose them. 
And so when you have that across the board, we have, you know, 20 people on our staff all doing that. You can imagine how crazy that gets. And, and so while the individual staff member really has to manage that, that donor relationship, we have to manage the technical side of it to make mm -hmm. sure that yeah. expiration dates are, are still good and the, the, the credit card processing happens or the donor statement goes out. So it all ties into that. Having the right CRM for that is, is pretty important as well. Yeah, excellent. Any questions for Bobby? It's okay if not, I just wanted to give you a, a chance to weigh in there. Anybody? All right. Well, Kimberly, let's, uh, let's move back over to you. Um, uh, your, uh, your response on the survey that said we dialed in our clear and concise messaging. Um, there's just no other way to say it. It just really blessed my heart. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a messaging guy. I just, I feel like we, we have to have our, our messaging figured out if we're going to do anything effectively, including fundraising. And so uh, talk to us a little bit about how this played out for you. I assume there was a point where you realized we don't have our messaging dialed in and, uh, and that needed some attention. So talk to us about that. Um, yeah, you know, Hope Kids, we don't do a ton of different things, which is a blessing or not. You know, it just depends on what you guys, what everybody is doing. Um, internally, we had our message figured out, but externally, it's never any fun when people are like, you know, the organized, they're like, make a wish, kind of, you know, like them. And you're like, <laughs> no, <laughs> everybody, no, we're not. Love make a wish, but totally not like them. So it's definitely saying, okay, well, let's take a look at this and let's see how we're getting this information out to our donors, to our volunteers, especially, right? The people that are the other walking billboards for you. Um, and we already had a logic model, which, um, was definitely something we had already thought about. We have a, our, um, president is an engineer by education. So he obviously loves his logic models and things like that. Um, so we sat down and looked at it and we actually made the investment in, um, getting a consultant. So, um, a consultant to come in and say, Hey, let's look at your mission statement. Let's look at your model. Mm -hmm. Let's look at. Mm -hmm. We um, have our five areas of impact that we say that are essential for our organization and how we are um, uh, treating our families. And really that consultant sat down actually with our chapter, with the Arizona chapter to said, let's go through this. It was a day long activity and let's just open it up and let's have everything down. So she went through all the different questions with us. She kind of messed around with our logic model, but really um, I think a lot of it goes back to your strategic marketing, obviously your strategic plan, you're having the key staff, it's all one component. But what helped us too was saying, okay, these are our five areas of impact. Now, how does that explain your mission statement? And you say that, that your families are being impacted in these ways because that is what you're supposed to be doing. Now prove it. So what's going on? Mm -hmm. Because as many of you know, when you're writing grants, they say, okay, what do you do? Okay, now how do you show, how do you show success? right? With your programming or the people that you're serving, right? Do you poll? Do you survey? What's going on? How can you prove this? So let's, let's prove it. So we were doing surveys, but um, you find, which they said was pretty common that um, you're asking leading questions. You're not asking the right questions. So it was kind of like, okay, let's remove all these leading questions and then let's make the questions more meaningful so we can tie them directly to our impacts. So we can show the percentages of families that are being impacted um, through our mission statement. So these numbers and everything was lining up. So we had a little bit of meat to our story. So it wasn't, yes, we're doing this. And yes, some families say it and they love it and they love us. But really it was now you're doing your survey and it's meaningful without leading questions and you have the actual numbers to back up. This is what our mission is and this is who we're serving and this is how and this is why and here's the numbers to prove it. Um, and we definitely all as a group actually sat down. We meet once a year with all of our chapters. Um, obviously our team in Arizona meets weekly, um, but it was something where we said, let's talk about, we had to read an article and some of us had to read a book you know, about mission drifting. So really what is important in making sure you're not mission drifting. And, you know, if you were offered, I think Jonathan, you've even said this, but where if you were offered a certain amount of money to do X, but it wasn't in your mission, are you going to do it? Or can you mold to that? You know, so it was going through all of those processes 
and saying, we're protecting what our mission is and we're now have the opportunity to explain to people. And that tied in with our marketing. It tied in with how do we create more transparency besides your 990? Because I like going to look at people's 990s, but how many of you guys like to go on and look at, <laughs> I'm going to look at, you know, one mission's 990 and really see what's going on. Dig in, right? Um, not many people. So some of your donors will, right? And some of us are blessed to be able to be a part of Charity Navigator and all those other organizations and have platinum scores here and there, um, which we've worked really hard to do because that's how a lot of people search for you. Um, and we found that our messaging, um, we needed to have that information. So teamed up with marketing. So we have one pagers now that are our roadmap of revenue. So it explains exactly where every dollar goes, the steps it takes, who it's serving, where it's coming from. We're very transparent of our vehicle mix, which is for us, that means where all of our revenue is coming in, which stream and how much percentage every single year. So every year we update that document and it's always something that's included to my donors. It's always something that's included when I write grants so they can see exactly where our money is coming from. Because a lot of grants, I'm sure you guys can agree, you'll see they do the breakdown. What percentage is coming from this yeah. and that? It's already spelled out for us and our CRM helps us identify that. Um, so it all comes together for us. And also if people always say, Oh, it's not all about the numbers. I hate when people say that that's not true. <laughs> it is about the numbers. Everybody wants to know. They may not want to know exactly how much you're bringing in, but they want to know how many people you're serving, how you're serving them, um, what types of people you're serving, where you're serving them. It just all depends for all your funding and your donors. So creating that one sheeter for us of the numbers was absolutely um, very meaningful for us too. That was a game changer and it's specific to our chapter. It has our impact areas, shows our survey results in that direct correlation of who we serve and how we properly do it. And the family's proving that. And mm -hmm. then where our money is coming from, how many events we have, how many volunteer hours we use all on one sheet. So it's like your elevator speech um, modified and it's there for you. And it's, we give that to all of our volunteers. I send it to every, anytime yeah. somebody, it's always in an email before I meet them, I print it. It just gives us that opportunity to say, here's our message and run with it. We always I, like, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we always no, like to say, great. um, I always tell people like, I really don't feel like I ask a lot for hope kids for donors. I just explain to them what we do and give them this information, explain the message. And it's always, how can I help? Yeah, and I love the concept, right, of mixing in the impact and the difference that the work is making uh, into who you are and your message and what you share about yourselves, right? Because that's uh, uh, incredibly, incredibly important. Oh, I could talk about this stuff uh, uh, all day, but uh, we, we, we've got to move on here. So um, great stuff, though, Kimberly. Thank you so much. Uh, a number of you also said uh, something that really made a big difference was uh, uh, focusing on uh, on, on branding and creating brand awareness and, and intentional marketing in your community. We've touched on this a little bit already, but uh, Nate, talk to us a little bit about how this played out uh, for one mission. And again, I, I, we're talking about intentionality here and I love that. Yeah, so I think we also used a consultant a few years back and which I, I think for really strategic times, consultants can be really valuable. You can invest some money. They're usually a bit expensive, but you can invest a little bit of money for a short period of time to help move your organization forward. So we did it around marketing, branding, storytelling, all of that. And that was really helpful in one, just having someone from the outside come and ask a whole bunch of questions and help us kind of work together as a staff. Um, and some of the things we did is we, uh, we, we, really discern like what makes one mission distinctive, what makes us unique from other uh, organizations generally, but then especially in the house building space or the community development space, what makes us unique. And so uh, having that then allowed us to, to market those things, what makes us unique. Um, we created what we call giving handles. So we broke down the cost of how much, um, our program, like for us, it's about like building materials. So how much do certain things cost? So then as we market and, and make asks to people, um, they know kind of where their money's going. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, we also invested in, in Facebook advertising. We had a, we hired a, a company to help us do that. 
um, and did a lot of targeted ads specifically around growing our house to house program, which is the, the one I was speaking about earlier with um, uh, the realtors. Mm -hmm. um, that's been, that's been really good. And then, you know, when, when key times arrive, arise for us. So we had a football player go on a, uh, a trip, a couple, three football NFL players went on a mission trip last June with us. Um, and one of them chose us for my cause, my cleats. So we mm -hmm. had one mission branded on his cleats. So we during were during an NFL game, during right? an NFL game. Yeah. 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 So yeah. when that happened, we were really strategic to do targeted Facebook ads to fans of the Denver Broncos in Denver, just about one mission. We, there was no call to action. There was no, um, there was no donation ask. It was simply like bring awareness because anyone who's a fan of this player, they'll probably never remember one mission. So then we thought, mm -hmm. how can we double down on that exposure? And who knows what will happen, but it's all about like, what little steps can we take, invest a little bit of money so that if people see our name multiple times over the years, the next time they see it, they may make a donation. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. There's obviously a lot to talk about here, but those are a couple of things that we, we've done. Yeah, there is. Again, I, I just, I highlight the thought process behind it right? And the intentionality and in, in realizing that if we uh, uh, want people to learn more about who we are, what we're doing and the opportunities that they have to get involved, then we've got to be intentional about getting in front of people and providing them with, um, uh, with opportunities to connect, which in some ways uh, flows into these uh, uh, last couple concepts that you guys have talked about. Um, uh, you mentioned a number of you, we raised up new relationships and new major donors, right? Which in a lot of ways is a result of uh, uh, intentionality um, and, and getting in front of specific people and giving them specific opportunities. And you also talked about uh, inviting more people to get involved specifically in the work. And so I'd like to sort of deal with these two together if we could and, and, and uh, Bobby, I'll start with you and then let's just have everybody jump in here uh, uh, how have you raised up new relationships and how have you invited more people to get involved in your work? How, how have you done that? How do you do that? I, I would say it, we have a unique opportunity because we utilize a lot of volunteers. And so volunteers get connected to your mission typically, typically because they, they already believe in it, but they're just kind of get a little taste of it. And so to be able to turn a volunteer into uh, a donor is this process of taking a participant and helping them engage. Um, and so that's, that's key for us, is I would say we start with volunteers and then those volunteers connect us to other groups. Sometimes that's businesses, sometimes that's churches where they have the power to give or the availability to give Mm -hmm. more than just your average uh, monthly donation. And, and so we've, we've actually seen that process grow by, by, by helping the volunteers get connected, see a next step, and see how that they can continue to, to expand. So opportunity right, for volunteer involvement is a key for starters, yes. Yeah, I think Bobby's right. Um, you have to utilize what you have. Don't try to go search for stuff. You know, use what's right there. We have um, typed out specifically how do we tell someone about it, and then there's a process to make that person hopefully become a volunteer if they're interested. And then once they're a volunteer, it's like they almost go to levels with us. And mm. it's typed out, it's very, um, it's planned, it's well planned, and then it's trained. So every staff member and key volunteer advisory team member, everyone's doing the same thing. So we're just not meeting all these people and then they're gone, right? We always know people will fall off face of the earth. It's like, where'd they go? Um, and so we wanted to really make sure that we have a really clear, it's again, this it's all about planning. So have it typed out, have it written out. Review it in your staff meetings and your key volunteer meetings of this is how we engage people and have your way to do it. Don't just say, oh, we're going to keep in contact or we're going to have them come volunteer. But once they do volunteer, what's the next level? Because they might be interested in a higher level involvement. They might not, but if you don't offer it, then you'll actually never know. 
And then some ways that we just meet new people, we're involved with local chambers of commerce. We go to BNI networking groups. Mm. Um, of course, anywhere anyone will invite us, we show up, we never say no. <laughs> and yes, it might be like me and two people when I actually get there. And that's okay, you know, you have to treat every meeting as you know, you never know what's gonna come out of that. Um, but definitely do put at least a key volunteer into the community that you're serving and they can start talking about who you are, what you do, and then some of those um, interests will come. And then for us, our key point is for our local centers is to get them come do a tour. If I can get someone to come in my one of our centers and actually just see what we do, how do we feed people, how do we clothe people, what kind of you know level of dignity and respect that we hold up, then once they see it, it clicks. So part of that planning for us is once I meet someone, they don't have to come volunteer necessarily, but I will only meet you for, I won't do coffee anymore. I only meet you at one of our centers for a tour. Mm. And then I know they're actually kind of serious, right? But I really genuinely want them to know what we do. And I can't really do that without showing you. Mm -hmm. And we've had so mm -hmm. much success of just coming in for a 15 minute tour. And then that person gets hooked. They might not talk to us for another year, but they're gonna come back around because they remember us. They saw what we did. Kind of like Nate in One Mission, you build this house with your hands. You see it, you feel it, you smell it. So once I can get that, then I actually have that long lasting um, impression on who we are. I only oh, take meetings in Mexico as well. Yeah. It makes it like, <laughs> uh, up my schedule and gets people hooked. You are really busy, Nate, really busy. Yeah. Well, I would reiterate what Nicole's saying about the, uh, the entry point too. We have a discovery day that is every month. So while, while I would also invite people in and meet at one of our centers, we have a set day every month that it's planned. And I know I can always invite somebody, hey, you should come to that. It's, and I know when the next date is. And if you hit our website and you go to get involved, that's what I want you to do first. That's the very first thing I want you to do is go to one of our discovery days. Because for the same things that Nicole was saying was that you, you, you not only see it, but you're, you're able to connect in it. And then if I can move you to the next phase of actually meeting some of the people and it becomes a relationship, then you're moving through the pipeline exactly like I want you to do. So I think those entry points are, are super key. Yeah, that, that's a great reminder. And, and the opposite of everything you guys are talking about right now is an organization who simply looks at people and says, we just want to try to figure out how to get you to give money to us, right? And there's no involvement piece there. You guys are talking about the opposite of that. And that's one of the main things that um, uh, I believe that God is honored in a great way because a lot of people are connected with a lot of your life-changing work. Uh, again, could talk about this uh, all day, but but uh, connected with that, I, I I, just for our last few minutes, I, 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 I really want to talk about this piece here and sort of pull it all together. And uh, Julie, when you submitted your survey results, you listed two things. And then as number three, uh, you listed God, but then in parentheses, you said, but not in this order. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so my, my, my question to all of you is uh, what does it mean for you to be a follower of Jesus and leading a nonprofit and, and being a fundraiser? How, how do the promises of God sort of intersect your fundraising work? And, 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 and what's, the, what's the connection there? What do you, uh, how do you draw strength from that? What, what, uh, what does that mean for you personally and for the work of your organization? I'll just open this up for a couple minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close. Yeah, I'd love to comment on that, Jonathan. I, I oftentimes describe working at the ministry or being there is I have a front row 50-yard tickets at the Super Bowl every day seeing God work. Mm -hmm. So when I invite people to join us in the work, it's like I want them to sit in that chair right next to me mm -hmm. and to see and experience what God does every day. And when we ask people to give and support us, uh, then we're inviting them to that chair to be a part of the story of what's happening on the field in front of us. Mm -hmm. I Wonderful. So, I yeah, so others. echo that. 
I so echo that, Julie, as well. Learning that to be able to share that excitement with, mm -hmm. with people, that God is doing incredible things in people's lives and inviting them to partake in that and to, and to be a partner in that was revolutionary for us in terms of just building those relationships with donors and for our growth, was looking at it as an invitation for them to see the work that God is doing and to join him in that. So I wholeheartedly agree, Julie. I agree as well. And I think something that um, I love personally is just having our prayer warriors, you know, on our side too, and having that program set up and knowing that it's just an email or call away and our families um, go to that and seek to that. And so do our volunteers and donors, everybody that is a part of Hope Kids can be a part of that program. So it's not just a family. It's not just a donor, not just a volunteer, not just a staff member. We're all there. We're all in it together and we're all praying for these kids. And we, um, you know, set it up. So there, it's daily. We're seeing every child's name, um, every child by name once a year, at least daily. So setting up those calendars and just knowing every day we're praying for each other. And let me encourage you that God knows what you as a leader needs to. I think that's the yeah. biggest thing. When I talk to other non-faith organizations, it's their stress just keeps going. We're all stressed out at times, right? but I'm able to give that to God. And he knows when I'm at my limit, like, Hey, I need some good news. Like we need, we need a good phone call tomorrow. <laughs> and I will tell you just from, ex it happens. Like he knows when you are just on all levels spent and then all of a sudden something crazy happens out of the blue that you didn't plan for, but it's going to, you know, cover that gap, whatever that need is. And, um, and that's just your reminder. Like, all right. Thank you, God. You're still listening. It kind of just really puts you back in, in line sometimes as opposed to others that don't can't lean on their faith. So as a leader of um, an organization, that's, that's, that's what it's about. If I don't have my faith and able to have that stronghold, um, then I'm kind of a hot mess. So um, lean in <laughs> every day and encourage your team to lean in. Yes. Anybody else? Final thoughts on that? Well, uh, thank you guys so much for, uh, for those of you who tuned in today, thank you for being a part of this. Of course, to all of you great uh, friends and panelists here, uh, so great. We could talk about this stuff all day. Um, and, uh, uh, and so some of you out there may have uh, some additional follow-up questions. We actually covered uh, just about every question that, that came in through the conversation. I will relook at those. And if we didn't touch on a subject, I will reach out to you directly on that. And we'll make sure that you get your your, uh, your question or your questions answered there. So, but I do want to let everybody go uh, now. And uh, let me just say a quick prayer for us. And uh, thank you again for being a part of this. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. God, may we not feel overwhelmed in any way. Um, but God, I just pray that you would speak to each and every one of us about a couple of things that we need to focus on, maybe just one thing. And uh, Lord, lead us and, and, and guide us and show us the direction you want us to go. We all want to reach more, help more, and do more. And uh, God, we pray that you would give us the strength to do that and that you would work through us to uh, meet needs and draw people close to your side. Thank you so much for this time together again. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. God bless.